Uh, yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can hear you, Commissioner. Okay. All right. Well, I can't see the chambers, but I can hear you. Um, I assume that Commissioners Mas Castillo and Carter are there. Yes, we are. Okay. Then I will call the Budget Committee of the Whole to order again. And um, at this point, we are going to, um, again, I'm not going to, you know what, I, I will repeat the, the information as far as the email address and the phone number for the Chief Clerk to Ramsey County for people to um, be able to, to call or send an email with public comments. Uh, the email would probably be best that becomes part of the public record, uh, but also to sign up for speaking at the public hearing that will be held tomorrow at 430. Its email is chiefclerk at ramseycounty.us and the phone number is 651-266-8014. Again, chiefclerk at ramseycounty.us, 651-266-8014. If you'd like to sign up, we will be taking people in the order that they sign up. With that, uh, this afternoon, um, we will be hearing from the strategic team and I will, um, and it looks like I'm looking at uh, the uh, different folks. Um, well, first of all, you can find this on pages 34 through 42 and Alex, Alex Kutza is going to the Chief Financial Officer for Ramsey County will be doing the introduction to the strategic team budget. And um, Susan Earle will then be doing the major changes. So I will turn it over to CFO Kutza. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, commissioners. I appreciate that it has been a long day and I hope you all took that break <laughs> to stretch and maybe eat some sugar so everybody can stay awake for the next hour and a half or so. Um, so today I have the honor of introducing the strategic team budget to you. Since it is a budget year, my colleagues said I get to do this, um, but I would be remiss if I didn't thank Director Elizabeth Tolzman um, and Director Gail Blackstone, as well as Sandy Blazer and Ann Feyman, the Deputy HR Directors for their work on this budget. I'll thank more people later on, but they, this is a group and team effort and so I wanna make sure I say that from the start. So over the past few days, I've watched some of the previous presentations by the strategic team. And I don't know if any of you remember in 2021 that Director Tolzman compared Ramsey County to a car. And she talked about how the strategic team was like the gas tank and the alignment of the car. Um, I thought that was really a great um, analysis or metaphor and I think that this past year when we ref when I reflected back on this past year we have worked really hard to keep this car running well and it was a very tough year so I just want to raise that up and this year as we look forward into the 22 and 23 budget the strategic team is building on our foundations and working together as a team to ensure that our car continues to run smoothly and never runs out of gas, right? Um, I th the, this budget was truly a team effort outside of Director Tolzman and Director Blackstone. I also wanna thank the budget team and particularly Melody Santana Marty, who without her, this budget wouldn't have come together the way it does. She does the heavy lifting and making sure all the numbers are in correctly and all of that work. Um, so if you look on page 35, that's where we start some of this, the presentation for the strategic team. As we mentioned in there, we are both an inward facing and outward facing team. So we are the outer ring of the circle when you look at all of the, the different service teams that have presented and will present tomorrow. I think of that as building the foundation and the supports all around the important policy work that we do both for our staff community and for the community at large. As you can see, our priorities include things that you've seen before. Talent, attraction, retention, and promotion, which is TARP. Um, that will be presented by Ann Feyman, Deputy Director of HR today. Community engagement and racial equity. 
which I hope you see embedded throughout this entire budget in every service team and also today in the strategic team that Director Tolzman will touch on. Transforming Systems Together, which Director Givens will be presenting today. Reinforcing Organizational Compliance, Internal Controls, and Ethical Conduct. Our Chief Compliance and Ethics Officer, Deanna Pesek, will be presenting that today. And I get the honor of presenting Foundational Excellence, which is an additional piece of the pie in this year's budget that I will highlight later in this presentation. All of that work, some of it newer, some of it from the previous uh, budget, the 2021 budget, all of it's about sustaining and scaling the work that we do. When I talk about foundational excellence later, I will talk about how it builds on work that you all have already done. I think you will see that in TARP and TST and racial equity and community engagement. We are sustaining and scaling this work because it is important to the county, it's important to the strategic team, and it's important to the residents of Ramsey County. For this budget, we uh, got to hold a budget town hall meeting for our staff community. It was very well attended. We had almost a 60 or over 60% attendance rate from our staff across the strategic team. And we also held for the first time community conversations about this budget. This was a first step in this process and I look forward to working with all areas of the county and the community toward the goal of participatory budgeting, which you've heard about from other um, deputy county managers in the budget hearings. The other thing we did, which gets little attention, but you will hear about it later, is the capital budget. It's a big deal to put out a capital budget and think about how we invest in our infrastructure and maintaining the buildings and land that we own and our assets. So with that, um, I want to take one more moment to thank the entire budget team under Deputy Director Earl's work this year. This is a big budget to undertake when you are newer to the county. Her entire team stepped up and helped do all of that work. Um, our whole strategic team, I can't say this enough, so I'm gonna say it one more time. We are very well aligned and working well as a team to support this county and the community. I think you will see that in this budget and throughout the presentations you will hear today. We have a number of presenters who are gonna be coming up and they are all gonna talk about similar things because we've worked together to make this a cohesive budget. Um, we are hoping, Madam Chair, if you're okay with it, to hold questions until after Ms. Santana Marty presents the Board of Commissioners so that we get the main strategic team departments and divisions done, then entertain questions, and then questions again after the countywide impact areas. Um, that makes sense to me um, because that, so that break is then at other areas of countywide impact, correct? Exactly. For questions? Okay, yes. that's fine. Thank you. So um, in moving forward, we plan to keep gas in the tank and the car well aligned moving forward. I'm gonna turn it over to Susan Earl to highlight the major changes for this budget and I'll be back to present the finance budget. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, Commissioners, um, I'm pleased to be here to share with you uh, the major changes of the strategic team budget for the 22-23 budget. Um, a couple items I'll highlight at a service team level. Uh, this budget builds on countywide community engagement work by adding $500,000 of funding towards this effort, um, and that funding will have a specific racial equity focus. Funds are also um, invested in foundational excellence, 1.2 million in 2022, and 1.4 million in 2023, um, which CFO Kutza has already mentioned and will um, expand upon later in the presentation. Uh, the budget also creates a central pool of 10 FTEs that, that the county manager can use to facilitate day-to-day -day county operations. Um, in the finance department, specifically, um, uh, 0.5 FTEs and $55,000 of existing funding is dedicated to begin building internal auditing capacity, and this is in addition to the audit capacity that will be discussed in the foundational excellence framework. Uh, in finance, we also um, 
allocate one FTE or add one FTE and $185,000 of existing funding dedicated to building out a permanent operational support services team. Um, this is the team that has been referred to in the past as the back office team, and they'll be focused on creating standards for managing and monitoring contracts and grant agreements. And this work will be highly influenced by the procurement process improvement work group. The finance budget also recognizes a shift of three FTEs and $316,000 from finance to information services. In the county manager's office, the budget recognizes an increase of one FTE to the TST program. This is an increase that was approved in 2021, so is now recognized in 22 and 23 in this budget. And then finally, impacting both the county manager's office and HR, um, the compliance and ethics office receives a transfer of one FTE from the county corrections department and 1.75 FTEs from the human resources department to move the county, excuse me, to support moving the county investigations unit function into the compliance and ethics office within the county manager's office. Um, those are the major changes for our service team. And so with that, I would turn it back over um, to members of the strategic team leadership team to share more specifics about their budget, starting with CFO Kutza. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I'm back. Um, I, I, as, as Deputy Director Earl mentioned, there are some changes in the finance budget, but there aren't very many. And I wanted to see if I could take this moment um, to introduce my team. So over the past year and a half, I have had a great experience here at Ramsey County, and I have um, been very well supportive. Everybody has been willing to step up and help me, and I really literally could not have done my job without my team. I also have had a significant amount of turnover on the finance team, and I would love if they were all standing up here with me today, but because of COVID, that's not possible. So we're doing a Zoom version of that, and I see them coming up. I've asked my management team, some of whom you know, many of whom you don't, to join us. And I wish they could each say something, but I'm just going to go around and highlight who they are, what they do, and one major thing they accomplished this past year. So you have some insight into the finance team and what we look like today, because when I started, it was a very different team. So I'm looking at who's on the screen. I'm going to start with Renee Vogt. You've seen her. She's the deputy finance director and has been with the county a little while, but was new right before into the deputy role right before I started. She, um, the major things that her area has done, she has a number of staff in the finance department, but the annual report, as you've seen, she presented earlier with a very good audit, a clean audit, as we would call it. And she's also been working on updating and establishing many finance policies that were not either old or not in place prior to this year. So Renee, give us a wave. Thank you for joining us. Okay, next up is Susan Earle. She's in the chambers, um, Deputy Director of Finance as well. And I need not say anything more than the 22-23 budget. She only started with us in December and has pulled off a biennial budget in a very short period of time. So next up I have Dana Nofke. If you can give a wave, Dana. Um, she's our procurement manager and has been with the county one of the longest tenures on the finance team. She uh, has, okay, since the beginning of COVID, like we changed all of our procurement practices. We um, did emergency pr procedures process. She served on the IMT. And now, because she didn't have enough to do during COVID, we are working on a procurement modernization project that you will hear about at a future Committee of the Whole, I'm hoping. Um, so then next up, Jenny Grosskopf is our new Enterprise Risk Manager. Jenny, great. She um, just joined the county. It's almost been a year. It was last October that she joined the county. She came to us from Dakota County, and um, one thing she said to me that stuck out is that she's really working on establishing a culture of risk management in this county. And I think she's done a long way to partner with many people. If you go around and ask all these directors, 
They'll know who Jenny is now, which is great, especially during COVID. And she's worked a lot of claims work, which she's brought here, but really kind of thinking about that partnership and how we become an organization that thinks about risk management in our everyday work. Okay, next up, thanks Jenny, I have DeAndre Lindsay in the corner. He goes by Dre, thanks Dre. He is also new to the county, he started in April. He is our debt and investment manager, came to us from private banking. Very excited he's gonna present a little later. Um, banking relationships, investments, and debt are really important. I think people don't give enough credit to those areas and how much they impact not only our financial impact, but also how we have relationships in the community. Dre is really good at relationships. He's maybe the only extrovert on my entire team. That's why we love him. Um, and so he's really great at that. And in a very short period of time, has established really good relationships all across banking, investment, and really thinking about our strategic approach to debt. Okay, next up, Carrie Learn in the middle there. Carrie, wave. Great. Um, she's our ERP capability manager and has the longest tenure in finance by quite a bit, I think. She, um, she used to report up through the CFO, now she reports directly to me and has worked on so many things this year. Really a lot of things in our world of our financial systems, IS type systems don't work without Carrie and her team. Just gonna name a few, the Hyperion narrative um, project, Kronos, which is how we enter time in certain areas so people get paid, and a check printing initiative where instead of printing checks on site, we're working with our bank partners to print checks for us and mail them out directly. So thanks, Carrie. That's just naming a few, she has a lot. I only understand about 50% of what she does, to be totally honest with you. Um, but that's, I'm learning about that as well. Then Tara Bach, hey Tara. So you've met her plenty of times. I'm sure she's been in the county a long time. She is new to finance team. Over the past year, she has literally taken from the ground up through successful implementation of the CARES back office team, and that work is gonna be folded into the procurement modernization project to think about, and you'll hear about it in Foundational Excellence, how we support community contracting, contract management, technical assistance, and she has thought that through and built a team. She only started last June, um, so it's been just over a little, just over a year. And it's great to have her on the finance team and I'm really thankful for her leadership in that space. Then we have Dan Ostertag. Hi, Dan. He is our payroll manager, a quiet force to make sure everyone gets paid, right? <laughs> He's worked hard to build a team. There's been a lot of turnover on Dan's team. Um, and also with the payroll consolidation work as a partnership with Human Resources. And then finally, Moi Li Yang, who none of us, literally all the people you see on your screen, none of us could do our job without her. She is the administrative help. She does so much more than that. I hate to just say that, but she helps make sure all of us do our jobs every day. She's helped with the check printing. She helps do vouchers. She helps make sure we have space. She helps make sure this happened today, that we have the community meetings. She's great and I really appreciate all the work. She's been here a little while as well, but has really stepped up over this past year to help me and I really appreciate all the work she's done. Thanks, Moy. So this is our team. Everybody give a wave. Um, they are very impressive and I'm very proud to be the CFO of Ramsey County and this team. Thanks for popping on and uh, thanks for indulging me in that, that moment of getting to know them just a little bit, even on a Zoom screen. So the last thing I wanted to mention about finance is that this team you just saw, we spent some time last January thinking about our word of the year and spending time kind of talking about what we wanna be as a team with so many new members. And we picked the word dare. And we wrote intentions and the word dare is driving our work. It's driving our goals and our work that we do. And I have a whole sheet and a handout. If you're interested, email me, I'll send it to you.
But to close, I want to share a couple of our intentions because I think it embodies the work we're doing as a team. So we intend to listen. We intend to build trust. We intend to be transparent. We will be problem solvers and facilitators. We will move forward to make thoughtful changes while honoring the work that's done bef come before us. There are a few more, but those are the ones I wanted to highlight today. Thank you for the time. And um, I'm gonna hand off to Elizabeth Tolzman, who's gonna be presenting the policy and planning budget. Alex, before you do that, yes. I'm not gonna ask a question, but I think it would be very um, nice if you would send that out to the, to the county board. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, first, I want to give a shout out to CFO Kutza and uh, Deputy Director Earl for all their leadership, planning, flexibility, and guidance in the midst of an ongoing pandemic and to kick off this budget cycle. I also want to thank the County Board and your ongoing investments in communications, risk management, open data portal, compliance, community engagement, race equity, and the strategic team has proven that we serve not only internally to the entire organization, but externally as well, to serve our residents, businesses, and visitors of our community. The policy and planning team plays a significant and fundamental role in the following ways. First, we lead in developing our strategic plan and priorities that advance the county's mission, vision, values, and goals as referenced on page three and four of the budget book. The $1 million in annual investments have helped support project management, coordination, consultancy, and community capacity building and advancing our eight strategic priorities. Second, we lead in the community indicators and performance measurement process in the supplemental budget years as referenced during budget kickoff and in all the metrics that you see from departments and service teams in the budget book. Third, we lead advancing our race equity work through our racial and health equity administrators and our investments in Prince Corbett, Sarah Holly, uh, Mi Chang, and now interim um, Rhea Zachary Hilton, and all the staff and leaders countywide who do this work in the space. The pandemic and the murder of George Floyd has showcased that this work needs to be at the forefront, not only value-wise, but in our operational decision-making, which requires ongoing and increased investments in deconstructing and reconstructing policies, systems, and practices that result in disparate impacts in a black, brown, indigenous, and people of color community. Four, we lead in our efforts to engage and empower community. You will hear from Director Gibbons in his work with transforming systems together. And we've learned through our CARES work that you've seen the value of policy recommendations and community governance of our equity action circle. Examples of where we invested our community engagement funds um, include culturally specific services, consultants, restorative circles and justice, reimagining justice for youth, 21st century parks, housing stability, community partnerships through our census and immigration, immigration and refugee work, diversifying our election judges, marketing and communication, trusted messengers, and community compensation. Five, we work with our newly formed Compliance and Ethics Office to review and update all the policies in our admin policy manual and admin code to ensure that it is reflective of our service team structure and it builds a strong culture countywide with, with accountability. Six, we work closely with the chief clerk and admin team to ensure that our requests for board actions and boards and commissions are reflective of our organizational values and that our residents are engaged in our policymaking process. Seven, we work in partnership with human resources and the DIOD team to support our newly formed employee resource groups, advance our race equity, diversity inclusion, and organizational development work countywide and with our employees at all levels. And finally, we work with our finance team to promote contracting and workforce inclusion opportunities and improve contracting policies, processes, and practices countywide. And on that note, I just want to call out um, one of our performance measures on page 61 of our budget book, um, where we are measuring the percent of total spend procured with certified small business vendors. And as you can see, um, in 2019, um, we spent about 12%. Um, and this year in 2020, um, even though it went down to 9%, um, there was definitely an impact um, from the pandemic from the past year. Um, that small business enterprise and veteran spending was around $25 million. Um, however, I would note that the number of CERT SBE vendors working with Ramsey County continues to grow. So just to give an example, 
In 2012, we only had 116 CERT SBE vendors. In 2019, nearly doubled to that to 200. And um, we are proud to share that as of August 2021, we have 1,466 uh, CERT SBE vendors. And of those vendors, um, just over 91% are minority or women owned and just under 44% are emerging small business vendors. So again, seeing some huge and significant improvements in, in how we do business. I would also wanna note that um, our percent spend um, increased um, with uh, nonprofits and governments, um, 11% and 5% respectively. This is uh, totals nearly $50 million or a 25% increase from 2019. In general, our CERT spend only makes up a small percentage of our county's overall procurement spend, and we have a unique opportunity to create new and expanded opportunities to grow and sustain diverse businesses. And we are partnering with finance, and we'll, at our next strategic team committee, the whole, or in an upcoming one, we'll be sharing um, uh, the work that we've been doing since our Keen report that we uh, showcased last September um, before the county board, um, our process improvement that we are working through our EPMO office, uh, the action teams that are working on service team wide in this work and how we're incorporating the feedback that we've heard from community, not only during the pandemic, but before that as well. Lastly, I just want to touch on the strategic and operational alignment around our strategic facilities, residence first, enterprise services, our flexible work and returning to the office, as I know this is really important. You heard from Deputy County Manager Berg and Deputy County Manager Hadeen on this when they presented in their budget. You heard from Director Kruger this morning on our strategic facilities work. And you will no doubt hear from IPR tomorrow um, through Dr. Director Mosser on our enterprises services work. I just want you to note that flexible work and return to office are things that we need to do regardless of what the broader strategic plan for facilities. There will be opportunities um, for work to change our footprint, operate fewer but nicer spaces, and modernize as we go. But this is a learning process over the next two years. But one thing that I will be clear is that resident engagement and feedback and service delivery and experiences will be at the forefront of this work. Through surveys of our staff, our residents, our performance measures, our technology, including our tech equity and digital divide work, our process improvement and service delivery times in both phone calls, letters, written correspondence, and in-person delivery services, and our uh, accessible facilities, not just where they're located, but ensuring that they have transit, access, free parking, and a way to get there. Also through our mobile staff, we have many staff who are visiting our residents in their homes or out and about. Um, and we will continue to evaluate and invest in evaluation and resources to ensure that we're improving as we go. We will also have opportunities through our navigators, family coaches, and our service centers that we've developed in the past year. And finally, I just wanna end on the note that our CFO Kutska said at the beginning about the van analogy. I think we're gonna try to trade it in for electric car in the next couple of years here. Um, but I feel like we're back in the right track. Um, you know, we, we got off the paving path um, given the past year, but we're heading in the right direction. And whether we become government on the go or goobers, and that G stands for government, not grandparents, um, our moral <laughs> compass <laughs> will be our four goals of well being, prosperity, opportunity, and accountability. And with that, I'll hand it over to our deputy uh, director, Ann Feynman, to talk about our HR work. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, the human resources uh, in our budget book is on pages 35 to 42 and 59 to 73. Welcome, Ann. Thank you, Commissioner Reinhardt. I appreciate that. Um, good afternoon. I'm Ann Feynman. I'm the Deputy Director of the HR Talent Team, and I'm pleased to share with you today some of the highlights of the work that human resources has accomplished in this last budget cycle and where we're going as we head into 22-23. In the 22-23 budget, uh, Human Resources does uh, increase our vacancy factor as noted on page 43. We are also transferring 1.7 FTEs as uh, CFO Kutzka uh, mentioned and $164,000 to Deanna Pesek's uh, shop as the Chief Compliance Officer. Investigations will be moving there. We believe that this aligns uh, more closely in terms of trying to keep um, a, a solid and ethical uh, line between human resources and investigations. So we are excited uh, about that move and supporting the investigations team um, in that. We believe um, that, you know, certainly through the 2021 budget cycle, 
uh, it proved to be challenging beyond probably any of our imaginations in terms of moving some of our strategic priorities with regard to talent attraction, retention and promotion or TARP and public pathways forward at the pace we really expected to. But what the pandemic, as we reflect back, has really provided us is an opportunity to reevaluate how we in human resources do things differently. It also shined a light on some things, even simple things that we can improve, for example, electronic forms and electronic signatures to help move processes along at a faster pace. We pivoted quickly to meet the needs of the organization over this past budget cycle since the pandemic began to ensure workplace safety by providing guidance on COVID-19 exposures, protocols, and leaves. We are incredibly thankful for our partnership with public health, including Laura Anderson and Dr. Agawa. Um, we learned to conduct meetings and interviews, job interviews virtually, and pivoted our learning environment uh, to a virtual space as well which didn't just mean moving to Zoom, but meant re-looking at, um, at our classes and how we designed those classes to be more effective in a virtual learning space. We provided tools, resources, and workshops to support our employees what has been an incredibly difficult time, including the social unrest and the pandemic. And we stood up employee resource groups in a very quickly time as well. Currently, we have five employee resource groups, and I believe there's a six on the way. Uh, we collaborated in new ways with our partners like the state of Minnesota to hire 300 plus full or part-time shelter staff um, to stand up shelter operations. We also partnered with Workforce Solutions and our community partners to hold virtual recruitment fairs, mock interviews, and provide meaningful public pathway opportunities such as the job shadows with hired in a virtual environment. And more immediately addressing talent attraction and retention issues we worked with all of you to approve our starting wage for our internal workforce to move to $15 an hour. With each challenge, we've evolved and continue to improve how we provided human resources. And while the work of TARP has slowed, um, we've certainly made and continue to make incredible progress. Executive team members, sponsored, and staff across this organization has participated over the last two years in what we call the initial discovery work of TARP and brought recommendations forward to improve this work. And while there are odds and ends to wrap up from this discovery phase, the implementation of this work, bringing these recommendations home to HR really has begun. And we are getting ready to set up a new advisory structure called the TARP Solutions Advisory Team. We'll work closely with our business areas, our race and health equity administrators on implementing this work. Some of the highlights from the TARP work include with regard to enhancing work culture, uh, working in co-creation with our employees around selecting behaviors that will really uphold and uplift our values of this organization. So specifically about what we can expect to see from employees and how we hold employees accountable to exhibiting those values, but what our employees can expect from us as an organization. I'm happy to say that we've completed that work but now we are in the process of developing a strategic behavior implementation plan and how we carry that work out to really begin to um, see the culture that we want to see across our organization. We're also taking those behaviors and incorporating them into the competency model that we um, previewed for you in December of 2020. With regard to strategic HR, over the past couple of years, we developed a framework and with which we want to work as strategic partners. And how we did that was through a couple of ways that we've shared with you in previous board workshops. With regard to leadership development, our HR team um, engaged in leadership and team development activities to clearly more define our roles and improve our relationship and communication across our team and across the organization. With regard to our own foundational excellence within HR, we really began to look at how we improve and consolidate and streamline our payroll and transactions function, both into human resources and working closely with finance. And so we are very um, grateful for the partnership and participation of CFO Kutza's team, as well as um, Deputy Director Renee Vogt um, in this work. And we recognize that those positions, those payroll and transaction assistants that are currently in departments, that those positions are working more closely aligned with HR and finance is critical to the employee experience in terms of getting paid right and correctly, but also in terms of how you, um, 
access leave or accommodations or onboard an individual, um, those positions have been critical and will continue to be critical to an employee experience. With regard to racial equity over the course of this year, HR coordinated um, and led a leadership uh, development for racial equity cohort across the strategic team, which is cohort, the first cohort finished, uh, and the next cohort is ready to begin. It's really to help us challenge and dig into the framework of our system rules and policies, which have been at times and continue to be embedded in white supremacy and how we as individuals, as leaders in this organization can really disrupt the cycle. And especially as we engage in revising our rules and policies in this TARP work. With regard to restructuring, we hired two deputies, one to lead the talent side of human resources and the other to lead the enterprise work um, including labor relations and benefits and our capability team uh, for this organization. We redesigned a service delivery framework to align our general services generalist to service teams. And we're super excited that that work is um, proceeding. We've developed a two week long retreat uh, for our general services members to be able to um, learn and, and grow through a change management process and really support them in becoming talent partners to the service teams. And I'm happy to report that that transition will be coming, coming soon in the middle of October. With regard to our performance management pilot, uh, Human Resources recently completed this pilot, piloting in a very short time frame our competency model, performance appraisal forms, and our um, individual development forms. And as we um, finished with that pilot, we had a feedback process by which um, we're happy to share out the results with you at an upcoming workshop. But we're taking that feedback to then tweak the tools. And we are hoping that that process has then continued to help build our HR team to provide better um, advice and better feedback to our managers and supervisors. We will begin a second pilot with two business areas to then get those business areas feedback here in October to launch in 2022. With regard to hiring process improvements, uh, we identified 26 specific areas for improvement. We've created timelines to keep HR managers, uh, hiring managers specifically accountable to timelines and to help streamline planning and move through the process more quickly. We hired 590 people as I reported um, last week when I presented out the workforce statistics, which is a big lift, um, probably almost twice what we normally hire within any given year. We remove salary data information from our job applications because that tends to perpetuate inequities in salary offers. We provided points for experience to individuals who participated in public pathways and also temporary employment with Ramsey County to help elevate applicants in the hiring and exam process. And in the public pathways and attraction space, we hired and onboarded our public pathways coordinator thanks to your investment. Uh, we've worked with our service teams to promote and obtain our initial service team commitments as we start to coordinate this from a more uh, streamlined and central um, impact or central place within uh, human resources. And just recently, we coordinated with Workforce Solutions, the city of St. Paul, to uh, streamline and coordinate our internal participation with Right Track Plus, having uh, 23 Right Track Plus interns here in the fall. Uh, we did ask for 40, but there weren't enough interns to go around. With regard to personal rules and policies, we received our recommendations from our consultant that we've been working with, with Gallagher. And HR has become the arduous process of revising those personnel rules and policies. We will work with that TARP solution advisory team to be able to um, work through what, what uh, impact it is to the business, to make sure that we're conducting a thorough racial equity impact analysis as well as we bring those personnel rules and policies forward. With regard to the class and comp work, um, as you know, we've been working with our consultant Gallagher and over the past two years conducted a classification study, created a new and improved classification structure, which we're getting ready to share out in the next couple of weeks. And we also conducted a compensation study showing that Ramsey County was highly competitive in the market. From that information, we presented to the board in December of 2020 a comp philosophy that aligned Ramsey County at the 65th percentile, which was closest to our actual pay right now, of the market rate and included a framework for steps until the midpoint and then a market until individuals reach the midpoint 
and then an enhanced performance zone beyond that, which the performance management work that we've been doing will support. Last week, I had the opportunity to present to our workforce statistics for 2020, which demonstrated Ramsey County's continued growth in diversifying our workforce. We grew from 36% racially and ethnically diverse employees in 2019 to 40% in 2020. This growth trend continued in promotions as well with over 48% of our promotions going to individuals who are racially and ethnically diverse up 5% from 43% in 2019. And our new hires, 61% uh, of our new hires were racially and ethnically diverse up from 57% in 2019 recognizing that um, many of those hires also came from our shelter system. But we know in HR that our disparities and inequities still exist in our system and that HR's work, even though we've done some good work, we've made some great progress, that we still have a lot of work left to do. This past year provided us with an opportunity to engage in, with community in a way that we had not before. And thanks to the work of Sarah Holly, our race and the health equity administrator, now our public health director, as well as Prince Corbett, who has been our, our leader in the racial equity space in terms of engaging with the equity action circle or the EAC. Um, we meet with them every two weeks and uh, Prince is on that meeting with us and working with us closely as well as Angela Carlberg in the space. And we discuss uh, strategies and partnerships around recruiting, hiring and promoting. We're looking specifically at working with Public Works and Parks and Rec. Mark McCabe and Ted Schottenker have been great partners in this work and really working on creating um, and promoting, building our public pathways and creating guidance around how we engage community in our application and interview process. This partnership helps keep us accountable to live our values and changes or cha challenges us to see things in new and different ways. I do wanna recognize my team, the HR team, in particular, my co-deputy, Sandy Blazer, for her partnership and her support over this last year and a half as I onboarded new to this job, as well as to our executive team and continuing to support the HR team and moving these goals forward. I also wanna recognize Jennifer Otley, who's led the general services team, of which a lot of this work has fell upon, as well as Jean, Graham, Jean Gramley, who is our operations team leader, who is, um, heavily embedded in this work and leading that policy work. And I do want to say a specific thank you to the DIOD team, uh, specifically our former manager, Maria Sarabia, but all of the team who really helped get us through um, supporting our employees through COVID-19, the social unrest, and setting up those employee resource groups. I also want to thank Kristen Schultz, who is our OSHA and Workplace Safety Coordinator, who has really led uh, the COVID response from an HR aspect I want to thank Allison Kelly, who's head of our labor relations team and negotiated one-year contracts um, in the midst of all of this and is now back at it. And then our benefits team, who is led by Greg Anderson, who pivoted to online enrollment in a really short time frame. And then finally, and um, Tammy Lafort, who has had to work through all the system pieces as our capability team, and Mark Peterson, who leads our investigations team. Um, they've done incredible work. I hope I didn't miss anyone. No law negates from the public pathways perspective, but um, so with that, that is our HR update and I'm going to pass it over to Deanna Pesic, who is our chief compliance officer. Thank you, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. And just for uh, people that are following along, um, your, the pages in the, um, budget book are, <clears throat> excuse me, 36 and then 59 through 73 as well. Actually, the next uh, two are in that same area of the budget book. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to share our investments in the Compliance and Ethics Office. As Ann Feeman said, I'm Deanna Pesic. I'm the Chief Compliance and Ethics Officer for Ramsey County. Um, when joining a new organization, Compliance officers are often asked, what are your primary concerns and what would you focus on first? I love this question because it invites a learning opportunity and it perfectly aligns with what we're discussing today as well. When I joined Ramsey County in October, 2019, there was no single function overseeing compliance. There were some elements of what's generally considered um, the essential components of an effective compliance program, 
but there was there weren't any centralized management. <clears throat> Excuse me. So my initial concerns were, what's the state of our policies and our policy governance? And how are we monitoring compliance with our policies? And how are we responding to non-compliance with policies or even with um, our legal expectation and regulatory requirements? Today, I'm confident that I can answer all of these questions positively. Uh, for policy management, compliance is partnering with uh, policy and planning with the common goal of structuring policy governance and investing in technology to improve user experience and enhance compliance. Some of which you've already heard from Director Tolzman today. For, uh, sorry, for monitoring compliance, um, sorry, for monitoring compliance, I'm partnering with finance to create an internal audit function, which we'll hear more about from Director Kutza um, in her discussion relating to foundational excellence coming ahead. For non-compliance, you've heard from um, Deputy uh, Director Earl that the County Investigation Unit will be moving from Community Corrections and from Human Resources into the Compliance and Ethics Office in October 2021. And we'll also add headcount to support the unit, which you'll hear more about from uh, CFO Kutza as well. The, the centralization of this vital function um, will enhance operations, transparency, and accountability. And as a part of the, trans, uh, the transition, we're already developing policies and procedures and guidelines to, to enhance uh, oversight. Um, we're also investing in technology to improve case management and record keeping, which is funded through technology governance. So it's not a part of this proposed budget, but I wanted to just highlight that here today. We will, of course, issue countywide communications and training plans to ensure that all investigations are effective and fair and efficient. And we'll also provide timelines and updates to the board through the audit committee. And we welcome an opportunity for a workshop uh, as well. Um, I wanna use my remaining time to just thank my team, Chris Bogut, Jolie Wood, uh, Zakaria Nagatu. I wanna thank Alex Kutza, uh, Elizabeth Tolzman, Mi Chang for their support. We partnered on more things than I can talk about today. Um, and I see Chris Bogut just popped up here. Um, she's been fantastic. Um, but, you know, a lot of these partner, these vital partnerships uh, initiated during the COVID-19 um, Compliance and Ethics Oversight Committee stand-up, which was uh, approximately five months into my tenure here. Um, but I also want to thank the County Attorney's Office for their support, John Choi, John Kelly, Sam Clark, Stacey DeAndre, uh, John Ristad, uh, Lindsay Millard, I know I'm going to forget someone, Liz Br uh, Brady, and Amy Schmidt, and also Information Services, which is a key partner for us, um, Rich Christensen and Eric Brown, as well as HR, um, and Anne, thank you so much, and uh, also Sandy Blazer and Gail Blackstone. But finally, I just wanna thank County Manager O'Connor for his decisive leadership and his absolute unambiguous commitment to embedding ethics into all aspects of co uh, county operations and service. And from there, I'll hand it over to Danny Gibbons, uh, our Director of Transforming Systems Together. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you all. Thank you, Commissioners. So Danny Gibbons, TST Director, um, just take a little bit of your time today. First, want to just jog you all's memory. We just had a recent presentation with the TST Collective that I would, I would just at the least name it gregarious, right? We had system leaders and community members at the table in person, as well as in a virtual land, uh, presenting an, uh, an amazing update on where TST is. Uh, just for starters, I want to mention that there is no initial change in the investment that the uh, board has made in this initiative as TST Transforming Systems Together is a new program that's overseen by a county and community partnership committee that's going to incent change in funding approaches to strengthen communities and reduce the need for justice system responses. 
there was uh, an addition of one FTE. Uh, that's my position, the TST director, uh, that currently I report to uh, our county manager, Ryan O'Connor. Uh, so coming on to this, we have a $2 million program in 2020 and a $3 million program in 2021. Uh, initially, there was, one, there was one million and two FTEs reallocated from the health and wellness programs beginning in 2020, and another million in a new levy funding in 2020, increasing to two million in 2021. Uh, we'll bring the JDAI and child welfare reform and integrated safety and justice into alignment alongside the expanded upstream nature of this work. Uh, and I just also want to just reiterate how important it is and how gracious we are for the continued and ongoing support of the board of commissioners uh, as we lean into the intersection of, of relationship building, truth telling amongst one another. We've identified a North Star and direction uh, that the work is going and moving forward and continue to value, as I said, you all's ongoing support uh, of this work with TST. I wanna thank you all for your time. And at this time, I'm going to pass it to Melody, is it San, Santana Marty, I believe. I hope I said your name right. <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you, Danny. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, as Danny said, my name is Melody Santana Marty. I am an accountant three in the finance department. I am fortunate to serve as the analyst and help support the strategic team. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone on the strategic team for their leadership and guidance in making this budget process as smooth as it could be for myself and everyone involved. I am here today to present to you the 2022-2023, that's a hard one to say, Board of County Commissioners budget. The 2022-2023 proposed budget was prepared according to the instructions that are prov provided by the finance department. These instructions help to ensure that there is an alignment with the county as far as vision, mission, and goals across the organization when it comes to budgeting. The proposed budget does include funding for the 2223 anticipated personnel costs, as well as the personnel complement remains consistent with the prior biennial approved budget at an FTE count of 18. Thank you for your time. And I think we will all stand now for the questions from the commissioners. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I think um, in the previous presentation, I misspoke. Uh, talent attraction, retention and promotion is what I meant to say for TARP in the previous one. Um, we've gone through a lot of information here. Um, and I guess um, any questions that you have for any of the presenters or, or uh, the county manager, whoever else you might want to direct them to, I'm open to that now. And I will start with Commissioner Jim McDonough. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, this is for human resources. I don't know if Ann or Ryan or anybody who might want to take this one, but and and you laid out a lot of work that's going on there, and I really appreciate it. There is a tremendous amount of work here to really kind of position us well for the future. And I may have missed it. It may have been part of some of the study work that you identified, but you know there was a time when I know we had talked about and we. I think we actually started some work on this and, and, and maybe even connected to the St. Paul College Metro State stuff of really reevaluating our job requirements, knowing that um, our biggest disparities in our community are, are along the lines of education, right? And so many times we, we make requirements and that's to weed people out as much as to get the best candidates, right? And when sometimes we're asking for a two-year degree when a certification might do, or we're asking for a four-year degree when a two-year degree might do. And I, I, I recall that we had started to do some early work, but I'm wondering how much of that have we actually accomplished? Is there really a concentrated effort? Or have we completed that work and I'm just not aware of it? But I think that's, that is one area that always kind of 
sits in the back of my mind to make sure that we're really aligned on our job requirements on what we need from individuals so that that's not a barrier to helping us achieve some of our other goals in, the, in, our, in our county here. Thank you, Commissioner McDonough. I can definitely answer that question. So it's, it's really two pronged, right? So we're looking at it from a public pathways perspective and how do we approach and expand the entry points and public pathways for individuals coming into the organization. And so some of the things that we are including in the fellowship ex um, opportunities are, are looking specifically at lived experiences and not just necessarily work experience. The second piece is that I was looking at all of our current job class specifications, which our general services team has been working uh, with Gallagher in doing over the past few months okay. and just finished. We're actually currently waiting on the final changes to um, conduct an audit and then send it off to the departments to take a look at it. Through that work, we have identified what are those minimum qualifications and have included substitutions where possible so that it's not, you don't necessarily need a four year degree, but what other types of substitutions um, can we provide? And so definitely through that work, we have, we have looked at that and uh, are incorporating changes to that. It doesn't mean that we're done and that, you know, we won't continue to evolve, but those have been two intentional pieces that we have looked at. Madam Chair, yep. County Manager O'Connor would like to add to that. Um, Madam Chair, Commissioner McDonough, Go ahead. if I could anecdotally just add one piece, I don't think it's just a part where we've been doing that through HR. So during the piece that Ann talked about here about the Gallagher work, it was the, the beloved PDQ effort across the organization of position descriptions and qualifications. It elicits groans because of the amount of work it took. Every job description was looked at at two levels of step review. So the immediate, like, they were submitted by individuals from that classification first. Anyone in a job class could submit what they believed it to be. Then it was reviewed by direct supervisor and then the supervisor of the supervisor. And I naively made the mistake of saying, I wanna do it just like everybody else, not realizing the number that would bubble up. And I ended up with a stack in front of me that was uh, like four feet tall that I got to go through of PDQs that came back. But through the process, you learn a lot and what I saw was that as we went through the levels, as you moved away from the person in the job, we tend to overinflate our own uh, positions in terms of what we think is required. And as I, we looked at it, yep. it, we did a really good job across the organization of checking one another and saying, but I think there may be other ways to identify and bring talent in. And so I'm, on a system-wide level, I think we've done a pretty good job here of doing that. I think the real key is not letting us have to go through the effort the way it took this time now moving forward. And then I think someone else had a comment and then I have a follow up, please. Okay, Commissioner McGuire, and then I'll come back to well, Commissioner Mc... Oh. Well, I thought some one, of the, one of the other staff I thought had jumped in. Okay. Um, I'm okay, just, we'll go and, back to you then. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, Ann and Ryan, thanks for that. I'm wondering if at some time in the future, maybe we could get a, a report out or understanding of how big an impact that had, right? Um, how much change did we actually do in minimum qualifications to help us open up that, that opportunity for other folks in our community? And I appreciate you calling out lived experiences versus you know, a work experience because that, was, that could be potentially another barrier um, you know, and then as I was listening to your response and Ryan's response, and I'm thinking, and I know this even gets more complicated and more work, right? Um, but, you know, how much of the minimum qualifications do we really need when we ask them to walk through the door? And then how much are we prepared to help actually provide some basic training or skill development to actually, you know, getting them competent for the job? And I go back to, you know, Sheriff Bostrom and his work of hiring for character training for competency us, you know, maybe adjusting a little bit of hiring for community and training for competency um, and not, uh, you know, realizing we're not going to be fully training folks to be able to do a job where we expect people to come in with some level of skill set or some experience or some education, but what is the right mix of that? 
Commissioner McDonough, we will Tony absolutely Manager. follow up on that piece um, with you and, and show the scope of change. We can do that. That might be a good workshop here to have on a continued update around the TARP talent attraction retention promotion work more broadly, and I'll put my head together with Ann and Sandy to work on that. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Commissioner McGuire. Madam, thank you, Madam Chair. There's just so much here, I, as, as with all of these uh, budget presentations, I just really appreciate everything that everyone is doing. And I just want to say I'm happy to be in this car with the and the gas and the, the structure that's taking us there. And I'm excited that we're going to be in an electric car at some point here. So yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about all of this moving forward and the team that you've all put together, the teams that you've all put together are, are amazing. And I appreciate your introduction of those teams because it is really good for us to see all the amazing people that we have working with us. I love your word. Uh, uh, CFO could said of DARE. I'm going to use it as well. I think DARE is a good one. And I'm guessing it's not an acronym. It's just the word DARE, right? So, I mean, if, you, if it's different than that, that's great. And uh, and um, Policy Director Tolzman, I love Goober. I'm going to use these words. Um, <laughs> I think they're, they're great. And... Um, Deputy Director Fema, and you've just been so helpful to me in the last year with um, with all the different HR issues. And so I just want to say thank you, uh, and and everyone on this call. Just thanks so much for all of your work in getting us to this place. And I look forward to any workshops that we have that's going to dig even deeper to all these things. So just thank you so much, Madam Chair, Commissioner Carter, and I both have questions. We can start with Commissioner Carter. Okay, Commissioner Carter. Thank you very much. What an evolved presentation of the strategic team. What a great team. Can we need your microphone? Oh, push the button. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ooh, I just yeah, wanted to better. say what, a, what an evolved presentation this has been of the strategic team from years back as we were defining the countywide work to today where it is clear that this work is about being a county of excellence that's united around using all of our resources in alignment to achieve our vision according to our values, our mission, our strategic goals. And you've pulled this work together from finance and policy and human resources and compliance and ethics and our transforming systems together and including our board of commission in such a way that it is just so very obvious that we're walking together, that we have this work deeply embedded, not just in the strategic team, but across all of the teams and departments. And you are able to reflect on it. The manner in which we have set our goals, we are focused on community engagement and also our equity focus and building together the kind of data that we need to continue to report and to observe our work. So I just wanted to reflect on that, you know, and really, really cooperate, uh, congratulate you for the achievements that are taking us in the direction we've, we've pointed. I know some time ago, we talked about what kind of goals we would have specifically, and I'm going to go now, to the contracting and procurement area. And you know, we were just saying, let's do better. Let's just do better. And we have, we're at a point in time now where we set goals. You know, we've gone beyond that sense of understanding that these are goals, you know, and that we can't know where we're going unless we point in a direction. So I want to appreciate the direction that we are doing better and also ask the question, I know that some time ago we reflected on participation in a metro-wide disparity study. I know that a lot has gone on these past years, and I'm not sure where the state is in terms of the collaboration of units of government in a NETS disparity study. But I just want to ask the question about our preparation to be able to take advantage of an opportunity should it arise to partner with other units of government to understand where we are as compared to our goals, to do the outreach and to collect the data 
so that we are all able to move together. Uh, would you mind, Director Kutza, just commenting or if in fact our county manager wants to on our preparation in that regard? Great. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Curry. Thank you for the question. Um, maybe Director Tolzman will want to speak up as well, but you're absolutely right. We have been preparing. We presented the Keene report um, just about a year ago. We continue to work on aspirational goals, which were outlined in some of the recommendations of the Keene report. We are doing work with our PCATs, which I think you heard mentioned throughout the EGCI presentation. We're also doing the procurement modernization. But to get to your question about the disparity study, I think all of those pieces make us ready. And there isn't one out there right this moment, but we do believe in short, I don't know when, I'm not gonna guess about when, but hopefully soon we would be ready to be part of that if the opportunity presents itself. I also think a future workshop early in 22 to go over all of our procurement work would be a great moment so we could highlight the work we're doing, some of those goals as well as the work we're actually implementing. Director Tolzman highlighted a few things and then talk about next steps towards achieving some of those goals and a potential disparity study in the future. I think County Manager O'Connor wants to add to that. Madam Chair, I'll just add two points. On the disparity study side, we have articulated to the state through the Department of Admin, who had convened a procurement working group at the state level and Ramsey County has been a participant. Even having not participated in the last disparity study, they invited us in to be a part of that group. We've said we'll be a part of that next study as a part of when it all comes together. It clearly fits with the outline of the approach here and even the Keen report shows it gives us tools. The only other part I would add is the pandemic provided a working lab that we never really asked for, but in this space actually provides some silver lining of opportunities where we've seen innovative contracting, community-based contracting, changing the models, workforce solutions being one area of that work, but then it touches into the support area that Tara Bach was on here representing today within Director Kutz's team about how we can contract differently and now embedding that work as a part of this foundational excellence. And so the time is right, your questions are good, we'll keep talking about it, but we're absolutely ready and poised to continue moving forward. Thank you very much. Commissioner Maris Castillo. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I wanna echo the comments of everyone else that we truly have a really dynamic uh, leadership here at the county. And I think that the, leadership, the strategic team is quite an example of that. As we look at the talent across this organization and leadership in our service team leadership and the strategic team, that's continuously looking forward and looking at our future, but also at the ready at any time have we've seen over the last 18 months to fill in gaps along the way and be t detailed and tasked off to other places while keeping us moving forward. And so I just wanna congratulate all of the leaders in the strategic team. And then I have one question early on when Susan was commenting about the budget. She quickly said that there were going to be 10 employees that were floating in the strategic team for Ryan's dispense. And I thought maybe he would want to elaborate on what that really means. So uh, <laughs> County Manager O'Connor. Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Modest Castillo. Yeah, it was funny. We gave this look in the chambers of like, we'll come back to that one. <laughs> so this is a good highlight for a broader piece. And I'm actually going to, at the end, go to Director Kutz if there's anything else she wants to add, because she's been helpful in thinking some of this through. And we're really at the front end nascent stage. And it's a good moment to get to talk about this, as I would hope from a policy and oversight, both budgetary and FTE perspective, this is an important conversation for the board in the coming years. One of the areas of organizational friction that slows us down the most is locating an FTE that is vacant at any given moment to simply make a move for a position. It slowed us down on housing stability. It slowed us down on setting up the navigator model. It slows us down on day-to-day -day single person jobs where someone didn't maybe just, it's not always as clean as somebody leaves one day and the next day it posts. There's these weird gray areas of Venn diagram overlap. And from the CFO's perspective and mine, we've been talking at the entire executive team about this. I wanna give them credit for being a part of this conversation as well. Our day-to-day -day staff complement reflects that there are vacancies in the organization, but from an organizational side, we are not well situated to take advantage of those at those moments of need. It's hard to locate those positions. They may be halfway into a system. These 10 positions are meant to reduce the loss of a week or two along the way when we need a position to simply say, use this position to get going, we will capture the position back here as you seat the person in this role or that role. There's no money associated with them. 
It's an organizational friction issue. I want to end by saying, though, the broader questions to have with the board, and by no means am I trying to open up this policy conversation today, is long term, does it make sense to have both an FTE headcount and a budgetary headcount, or should we focus more on one than the other, with reporting being the other piece to it? And that's a decision for the board to always maintain. In some ways, the FTE headcount feels a little bit artificial relative to the budgetary side, but how we do all this is important, and over the long term, what we're trying to figure out is, even regardless of that policy decision, um, is how do we capture vacant FTEs and house them in a centralized place? Not because we're taking them from areas, but because we wanna help um, increase the velocity, and we all know you all get frustrated with us when we get bogged down. Is there anything, Alex, that I missed you wanna add? I don't think so. Um, thank you for the question. I guess what I would add is, it's some of it's about, we have budgetary controls. We're not gonna overspend the money, but often people get shifted, say, they're gonna go work in the enterprise services as a navigator or do something else. Well, a smaller area like the county manager's office might not have a vacancy to fill behind them and they're still filling that position. So this will kind of relieve the pressure on the system. Instead of having to come back here and say, hey, could we have an unfunded FTE? Well, we work through, I'm hoping over the next year, we can work through exactly what county manager O'Connor said thinking about the entire system and how we take advantage of the vacancies throughout the system while allowing people the flexibility to address their needs in real time. Thank you, that was really helpful. Thank you. Okay, well, as far as this section of our strategic team budget, um, basically what I heard was not necessarily questions that would come back to us immediately, but rather that there are at least two uh, workshops that we'll be having sometime later this year um, and or into early next year. And actually, I know there's more than that because of the Gallagher study and, and different things there. But the two that I heard, um, one was about a hiring report um, on qualifications and how much that changed and to try to uh, quantify that. Um, and the reason that I, I thought I heard anyhow that we would be that that would be answered in part uh, through a workshop that was on the overall, um, the changes that we were making in HR. Um, and then the other one, of course, is on procurement. And um, I believe that there were a few others that were just um, basic uh, workshops that are related to the strategic team, but those were the two that I thought were, um, that um, kind of uh, came, came out at me. Anyhow, um, is there anything else that I missed in the first part of this? Okay, well, I do think that um, especially uh, Commissioner Carter um, previewed this next section very well, <laughs> and that is and uh, is the foundational excellence. Alex, um, our CFO mentioned that she was going to take that over um, when we got to the other areas of countywide impact. And so I will turn it over to Alex. This can be found on page 37 of our budget documents. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioners, um, yes, I get to present foundational excellence, the additional piece of the pie today, which is very exciting to me. Um, as Deputy Director Earl mentioned, it's a $1.2 million investment in 2022, increasing to a $1.4 million annual investment in 2023. It becomes, foundational excellence is, becomes the fifth piece of our strategic priority pie, and it really is foundational for the entire county. Um, I get the honor of presenting it today, but I think you heard some of that from Deputy County Manager Hadeen last week, and also throughout the EGCI presentation today, people talked about contracting, they talked about accounting and finance and compliance, and I heard it there as well. At the base of this initiative, it's really about ensuring that the policy work that we do on behalf of Ramsey County is done with proper oversight and supports. This is not new for the county, nor is it new for you all to invest in this work. You've been doing it for years through the enterprise risk management area that you invested in a number of years ago, the compliance area that our chief compliance and ethics officer mentioned earlier, Deanna Pesek, and others. This builds on that work and makes it very intentional and specific. 
So there are five areas of investment. I'm gonna go through each of them and focus on what we are investing in and why it's really important to the work that we do as a county. So the first area is internal audit. This is led by Deanna Pesek. And what this does is right now we have a contract for this work and this increases the FTs to four total FTs with 3.5 new FTs and half an FT funded through the finance budget. It will improve our work. Audit, I always tell people, audit is not a gotcha. We all need auditors. I, I, my dad's an auditor, so I have a special place in my heart for them. But um, we need them because in finance and many other places, they help us do our work better. They improve our work. They help us anticipate issues. They mitigate risks. And ultimately, this area will help us track all of the audits, federal audits, state audits, and all of the responses to audits that we need to do so we can do proper follow-up and we can report out to the county board and others. The second area is investigation capacity, also under Deanna Pesek. It's a compliance function and the centralization of this, as she mentioned in her presentation, is really key. Making sure that that work is done intentionally and with a focus on work culture improvements for the entire organization. We are adding one FT in this area and consolidating 2.5 other FTs from both human resources and corrections under the compliance office to do this work. The third area, operational support services, is within finance and under Tara Bach, who was on the screen earlier. This started as um, Director Earl mentioned, it started as the CARES back office. And really what it's about is creating standards for the management of grants and contracting work, responding to what we've heard from the community about how our contracts work, and thinking about how we provide technical assistance, how we provide different ways of contracting to get to Commissioner Carter's question before. This adds two FTEs within finance, and it also adds 1.2 FTEs in the county attorney's office. That's an important piece, as they are key to our work in contracting and procurement, and I have been partnering with the county attorney's office to think through how that work looks and how we work together in partnership to make sure that we're contracting, doing it both from a legal and financial and community-centered and thoughtful way and so there are resources there as well. In addition, there's one more FT that's funded by finance in our existing budget. I do think as we go through the procurement modernization process, you will see that work evolve over time and that that group in particular, that operational support services will look different and maybe be added to as we think about what should be centralized and what roles different areas should play in the contract management world. The fourth area is building payroll capacity. You heard Deputy Director Ann Feynman mention this um, about centralizing payroll and the benefits work. That work is now underway in partnership between HR, finance, and all of the service teams as we think about how we do that work better to support our employees and create consistency. As Deputy Director Feynman said, so you know what you're gonna get paid and it's correct, right, when you get your pay cut, paycheck. Um, this creates two FTs in the first year and decreases to one FT the second year in anticipation of um, efficiencies in the process. You know, we're bringing together a lot of individual areas into one centralized place. We will continue to monitor and revisit that as we look at that team and how they do their work. That would also be through attrition. So we do have turnover that works itself out throughout all of these FTs. The fifth area is building capacity in human resources for equal opportunity, affirmative action, and ADA compliance. This is um, really important, and HR can speak more eloquently to it, but this is a compliance effort. This is support for employees. This is technical expertise. This is really foundational to any organizational's work, organizational work to think about how we support our employees in these ways. It's also a compliance issue from the standpoint of the federal and state laws that mandate the work that we need to do in this area. This adds two FTEs for that effort. 
That's a total of 12.2 FTEs, both between new FTEs and funded FTEs within the budget. I, I'm really proud of this work. Um, our team came together. There were many people, as you heard me mention, who thought through what this means. This is by no means done. We're gonna, you heard earlier that County Manager O'Connor mentioned evaluation. Maybe that's the next step. But I think this is a great effort and we listen to our service team partners and we're striving to solve some of the major issues that we've seen since we've been here as, as a team and work across the county and with community to make our foundation strong so we can do our policy work all throughout the county. And with that, I will turn it over to Susan Earle, who's gonna present the administrative agenda and the fee report. And at the end of this section, we'll be open for questions as well. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Thank you. Go ahead, Susan. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, the administrative, I'll start with the administrative agenda. Um, for the commissioners in the chambers, I've passed out a, a hard copy. For commissioners that are online, it um, should be in your email inbox, so I can pause for a moment to and make sure that um, y'all have it in front of you. And the same thing is true. So the email I sent has both the um, administrative agenda information and then also the fee report. It came in at about 2.40 this afternoon, if you're looking for it. Okay, anybody still needing time to find it? I think we're good to go, Susan. Okay. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. So the administrative agenda provided to you today reflects two types of changes. Uh, there are technical corrections um, or updates to the budget identified, and then also um, updates to the budget to account for RBAs that you all have approved since the budget was built. And so the, it, it's a mix of both, and the um, agenda is organized by service team, and then department below that, so you can see what's included uh, for each service team if there is an administrative agenda item um, coming forward at this time. The only item with a levy impact is, uh, that I just wanna make sure to highlight is in the libraries. Um, so that's on the second page under the Economic Growth and Community Investment Service Team section. Um, this technical fix brings the proposed budget into alignment with the 1.55 and 4.54% increases respectively for 2022 and 2023 that County Manager O'Connor presented on August 24th. The rest of the changes are levy neutral um, and so don't have an impact to the, to the levy, but impact um, items, as I mentioned, catching up the budget to RBAs, also making um, corrections to the budget and um, doing some accounting shifting or some reorganizing within the budget uh, as presented by County Manager O'Connor um, in late August. So these changes will be combined with other technical items that may come to our attention throughout the process um, additional RBAs approved between now and the end of the year, and then any commissioner requested changes. And then that final list of agenda items will come before the board as the final, as part of the final budget and levy adoption that we'll do um, in December. The other- I guess I do, I, I do have a question on the library one. Sure. Because we just heard from the library um, budget proposal that we're um, just reducing a, a couple of hours that basically hadn't been utilized anyway. Um, but this says additional levy funding for library hours. And so I, that, that um, and it's uh, the same amount in both 22 and 23, which is fine, but that seems to be the opposite of what I thought we heard. Sure, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the question. So this is a, a technical fix to make sure that what um, County Manager O'Connor presented is actually reflected in the budget. So what um, Director Salta spoke to today is their full presentation or is their full proposal, which does include some of those hours adjustments um, to get those operational efficiencies that she discussed. Um, there, were, there were dollars that were not in the printed book um, in order okay. to fully fund the budget and operations as presented by Director Saltis this morning. Um, and so this catches that up. So I apologize for the confusion. It does sound like sort of two different 
answers. This yeah. is the this is the okay. technical to make sure that so, we're aligned with what she had spoken to this morning. So it was inadvertently not included in the original uh, presentation to us. Okay. For, uh, yes, it, uh, Madam Chair, it was in, um, left out of the actual the the binder, the budget book that you all have, and mm -hmm. um, so we need to make sure that we're catching that all up, and that we have the authority to then um, put that full levy amount out there. This also will then align with the um, maximum levy resolution that we'll bring to you all next week at the board as a board. Well, given the size of that book, <laughs> um, it's amazing that you could find some of those. Uh, small items that, um, as you said, are technical in nature. Are there any other questions? Then you can move on to the, uh, the fee schedule, I think, is the other item. Great. Um, yes, Madam Chair, the other item I've um, handed out and emailed is the fee report. The, um, these fees are no, and the noted adjustments in the um, report that we've, I've handed out. And actually I should pause and say a very big thank you to Melody Santana Marty who does a lot of work um, to collect this. Uh, and also a thank you to service teams to, for compiling all of this information into one report. Um, the fees are built into the county manager's proposed budget and then will be approved as submitted to the board today when you take final action in December. So this is incorporated into that final budget approval that we'll do in December. Um, this year, I'll highlight that we've adjusted the format. I believe in the past, you've gotten two packets of a fee report, one that's comprehensive and then one that just highlights the changes. Um, we've instead highlighted in yellow the changes, um, any fees that have changed this year, just kind of cut down on the, on the paper and the um, length of the reports and hopefully make it a little more clear and accessible and have all of the information in one place. So for example, the fee, fee changes discussed by uh, Parks Director McCabe this morning reflect, um, are reflected in this document and highlighted so you can, can pull out what's changed um, from 2021 into the 22-23 budget. Um, we're hoping that this will be a little bit easier to navigate and more streamlined document. The same report is also posted online to our website uh, for the budget, our, our budget website for the public be, to be able to review as well. Um, I'll also say that prior year fee reports are available online for those interested in seeing the evolution of, of our county fees. Um, so all of this is out there as part of our budget information at year, at each year. Um, and I realize that this document, while, while we tried to streamline, is still a lot to digest. So if folks have questions, if commissioners have questions now, I'm happy to take those. And if it's something I can answer today, happy to do it. Otherwise, we can certainly facilitate follow-up um, questions if there are specifics on fees that I can't address today that need to go to the service teams. Any questions today? Okay, sorry. Um, if there's any, oh, Commissioner McDonough has a question. I have two actually, one for the fees. I just wanted to confirm that the public document is formatted the same way where it's highlighted where the changes are so the public can find those changes as quickly as we did when you set that out? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner McDonough, yes. This exact same document that you all Perfect. have electronically and that was handed out here will be posted online if it's not there already. Perfect. And then a question for Alex on the foundational excellence piece. And I think this is all really good work. Um, very supportive of it. Um, a couple of things. Some of this is centralizing in some ways work that, that's been going on in some of the departments or in parts of the county um, but then elevating it and making it countywide or centralizing in some ways there's some new things in here that's great um, you mentioned there's 12 FTEs and I didn't I didn't keep track as you were going through each area um, between um, new newly funded positions and then um, currently funded positions that are being reassigned or reallocated. What is the actual breakdown between the 12 of what what are newly funded and what are coming out of current budgets? And I have a follow-up question on that or comment on that. Great, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner McDonough. It is actually 12.2 new FTs, but, well, I'm gonna correct myself. Some of them are funded by finance, so we funded one position in the operational support area. We also funded half a position for audit within our budget that you see proposed here. We also have a transfer from HR and corrections. 
So the actual new FTEs, if my math is correct, and I know um, Deputy Director Earl will correct me later, but I had 10.5 new, brand new positions being created in this initiative. And then the other to get to the 12, over 12 FTEs is the funded ones in the finance budget. So and these are correctives. new overall positions I think so. to the entire county, not um, people that have uh, not positions that have been moved from another area. Correct. I think that um, was part of what, okay. Correct. With the $1.2 million, some of those are funded partially because we know we're not going to fill them all on January 1, right? So we accounted for a delay in filling some of those positions, but the $1.4 million includes all of the new positions funded. And I think Deputy Director Earl is gonna to add to that and help me out. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, it's, uh, just to clarify, it's, it's, as um, stated in the budget book, there's 11.2 new FTEs, and then um, the one FTE that uh, CFO Clips had mentioned, is a, a, there's a repurposed one as well. Okay. So 11.2 yeah. is the total new, um, and that's on page 86 of the budget book for reference. Commissioner McDonough. Yeah, thank you. Um, I thought I heard a couple were coming from corrections. Um, Commissioner McDonough and, and um, Madam Chair, the, I guess I wanna be clear, and I'm, I'm, I hate to point, but I'll, I'll look to CFO Klitsa and, and um, uh, Deanna Pesek if she's still on. So there are also some work happening to um, consolidate the uh, investigation or the county investigations unit in within mm -hmm. um, the compliance and ethics office. And so I think we might just need to, we can do some more work to tease out. It, it's all related work, um, but what is included in the new FTEs and what we're, what CFO Kutz is mentioning in terms of foundational excellence versus what we are also moving over and shifting over um, to Deanna Pesek's office and, and her work there. Yeah, if, I'm not Madam Chair, sure if, I can, if I can just add, those are transfers of FTEs from one area to the other. They are not new FTEs. So it is a little bit confusing. I think we can probably make a chart that makes this pretty clear in yeah. short order and get it to you. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful to see like all the FTEs that are associated with this foundational excellence work, how much are newly funded and which ones are, you know, whether you're funding them or corrections or their transfers because this kind of gets to my my comment here. You know, we've done some, some of those work is totally brand new, but some of it is actually work that's gone on and maybe some parts of the county or some departments because they've either had to or they're just ahead of us. And we've done some centralizing of, of things in the past, you know, communications under John Stigland, you know, some counties were doing their own or departments were doing their own um, and some other areas and that's always in the tension then, right, is um, pulling the resources that are already going toward this work, what, what, even when it was, you know, specific to a department or a part of the county, and then helping pay for it in the centralized area, or, you know, departments want to keep that money in their departments, or, you know, those FDEs reassign them other duties. And I I, I really support, you know, not everything needs to be centralized, absolutely not, but I support us, you know, using best practices in, in areas where it can actually strengthen us in achieving our mission and, and, and achieving our goals here when we can centralize and, and uplift some of the areas, you know, whether it's compliance or investigations or some of the other work you talked about. But I really want to make sure that we're really teasing out and digging deep in the budget so that we're you know, if that was being done in another department by a, a department or an individual, whether it was half time or three quarter time, that we're pulling those resources along with that work so that it doesn't have to be all new levy funded as we're building these types of areas. So, does that make sense? Madam Chair, Commissioner McDonough, that makes perfect sense. I think there's a, there's a piece to what we'll send back your way that goes beyond FTEs and levy alone. That tells part of the story, but what you're actually getting at there also is, what did we learn along the way here about what was being done or quite frankly wasn't being done in the past? And um, 
Depending upon the area, the answer will look a little different for the compliance and investigatory work. It'll look a little different with the payroll transaction right. attorneys. But we'll, we'll provide some narrative, because I think it's important to see how we did our homework to get to the conclusion we made for the reasons you're citing. Good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good question. And I like that because, yeah, I think we were focusing in on the total rather than the individual FTEs and where they came from and how they were funded. Um, and most importantly, what their purpose is, because we're trying to make sure that we are, are um, watching or making sure that what we're spending our money on is reaching our goals. And that's something I know Commissioner McDonough has talked about a lot. Um, and that's what I think that they're trying to get at in this particular area for foundational excellence. Okay, any other questions on the administrative agenda or the fee report? Okay, then we'll move to, looks like Susan again and Steve Kuhn uh, on the capital improvement program. That's on pages 578 to 602. Not sure who's gonna lead that off. Um, Madam Chair, this is Susan. I'll um, kick it off br briefly and then um, Steve will fill in some more details. Um, but I wanted to just start off by highlighting a few key points on the overall strategic direction of the proposed capital improvement budget. Um, this year, or this biennium, excuse me, we've increased the bond funding available for both major and regular projects. So for regular projects, we typically bond about $4 million each year. And in this proposed budget, we're bonding for $6 million in both years. And then on the regular, um, or excuse me, on the major project side, um, we typically bond $10 million, and this proposed budget includes 13 for 2022 and 2023. And this recommended increase for this biennium in the capital improvement budget is based on a few key points. The first is that the increase recognizes the needs of our community for both safe and well-maintained assets and for jobs and economic opportunity that accompanies these kinds of capital investment projects. Um, interest rates are at historic lows. So this is an, an ideal time to maximize our available bonding resources to support this work. And finally, um, we're able to fit this increase into our existing debt levy for 2022 and 2023. Um, so for those reasons, the county manager's proposed budget recommends more bond funding this year than typical. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Steve Kuhn, to, um, a financial analyst on my team, to share more of the details on the 22 and 23 budget. All right, thank you, Susan. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm Steve Kuhn, Principal Financial Management Analyst with the Finance Department and also coordinator for the Capital Improvement Program, the CIP and CPAC. CPAC is the Capital Improvement Program Citizen Advisory Committee. And CPAC is comprised of 14 members, two members who are appointed from each of the commissioner's district. And online today um, is Jim Miller, chair of CPAC. Um, I'll first go over the various parts of the capital improvement program and its budget, and then Jim can explain like CPAC's role and involvement in the CIP program and CIP budget and add any other comments. So I'll be referring mainly to pages 589 to 598 of the proposed operating 2022-2023 budget book. And those pages list the various projects and components of the proposed CIP budget. Pages 589 to 593 are for budget year 2022. And then pages 594 to 598 are for budget year 2023. The details of each of these projects and component is in the 614 page capital improvement program proposed budget and plan book that which is a separate book in itself but that gives a lot of detail on each of the CIP projects that are being proposed and the various components. To highlight the CIP program is a six year plan to identify the county's capital uh, buildings and infrastructure needs and is used to coordinate timing and financing of CIP projects. The CIP has two main components, which is the non-routine capital projects and then the routine capital projects and within each of those components are like two subcomponents. First of all, I'll talk about the routine capital projects that made up the two subcomponents. Um, if you go to page 592, 
that's uh, for 2022. And then again, 597 is for 2023, basically a mirror of each other. Um, the first part is the building improvements property management. And that's um, where property management collects about $3.5 million per year from rent paid by departments to the internal service funds. And these are buildings that are managed by property management. And of the rent collected, $1.50 per square foot is used for the capital needs, such as period, um, maintenance and repairs, carpeting, painting doors, generally projects that are less than $50,000. And um, again, they collect rent from like tenants in the Metro Square and the courthouse, and even like the sheriffs paying rent at the law enforcement center. And again, the funding for this rent is in the various county departments operating budgets. So that's how they pay property management. The second piece or component of the routine capital projects is what's called the building improvements slash repairs. And that's formally CCAMP. There is a, a proposed CIP levy that's been going on for a few years now, $1.1 million. And actually pages 95 to 99 describe that CIP levy of the $1.1 million. That's where there's building areas that are not under direct management of property management. Mainly uh, there isn't like a county uh, tenant such as a historic barn gets allocated money. Landmark Center, which is managed by Minnesota Landmark Corporation. And then Parks and Rec received uh, the bulk of that funding because they manage their own programs and buildings. Um, now going to the non-routine capital projects, that's made up of two components and that's where we bond uh, for what's called regular projects and we call major projects. The regular projects are the 50,000 to $1 million funded by 10 year bonds, plus like fund balance sometimes, federal, state, local and wheelage tax. And this is usually for replacement, enhancement, or renovation of a building or building component. On page 589 and 590 lists the 2022 regular projects proposed for $6 million. And then pages 594 and 595 list the projects proposed for 2023. Again, that amount is $6 million. How these projects are determined is by a rating process where points are calculated from CPAC member ratings and from county staff rating each project. These rankings are then combined to give an overall rank to determine which projects to be proposed for funding. For example, on page 589, and this is the regular projects are organized by service teams and department, the number two overall ranked project was the landmark center fire system update for 239,400. And like on page 590, rank number one overall was the Lake Owasso residence fire alarm system replacement for 80,000. So those list the various projects for regular projects, those two pages for each year. The second component is the major projects and those are bonded projects greater than a million dollars funded by the 20 year bonds. And those start, those are listed on page 591 for major projects proposed for 2022 and page 596 for major projects for 2023. And um, these also, these are funded by 20 year bonds and may be funded also by federal, state and local funds. These are bigger in nature, such as a purchase, renovation or construction of a building the major projects that are proposed these two years cover themes that are kind of that are under like maintenance, public facing slash recreation and strategic development opportunities. Uh, the 2022 major projects, some of those under maintenance are the $3.5 million for building automation systems, $3.5 million for Metro Square exterior envelope repair. $1.4 million for safety and security enhancement at the adult, excuse me, at the adult detention center. Uh, some of these projects have been mentioned in uh, prior departmental budget presentations. Under the public facing recreation, the four million, there's $4 million for Goodrich and Manitou Ridge golf course improvements. And then $20 million under strategic development. 
The total for major projects is $33 million. So the grand total for bonding is $39 million, $6 million regular projects and 33 ma uh, major projects. Um, the strategic development, the $20 million, that could be used for any you know, big development, even such as like going forward with River's Edge and Rice Creek Commons are a couple examples. For 2023, again, $39 million under maintenance. It's like $4 million for 90 West Plato exterior renovation, $2.1 million for the courthouse roof, $1.5 million for the care center HVAC, $1.5 million for safety and security enhancements at the ADC. And then again, under public facing slash recreation is $2.7 million for continuation of the Goodrich and Manitou Ridge golf course improvements. And then um, to round it out, but again, $20 million for strategic development, again, for those projects that could be such as River's Edge or Rice Creek Commons. So the total bonding amount, again, um, is $39 million for 2022 and $39 million for 2023. The bonded amount is funded by the debt service budget by the proposed $20.7 million annual levy. And uh, this budget will be presented next today. Um, as Susan alluded to, we normally bond about, you know, uh, 14 to $15 million for regular and major projects but we're uh, proposing $39 million. There is extra capacity to uh, bond for projects and since bonds weren't issued in 2017 and 2020. So the levy was collected, but then accumulated in the debt service fund balance. So the debt service levy then is used to pay back those 10 year, and, uh, 10 -year bonds for regular projects and 20 year bonds for major projects. So with that, um, I could turn it over to uh, Jim Miller if he's online and yeah, thank and you, Steve. I, I, could I, um, we, have, we are running over a little bit. We've got one more presentation. I understand that uh, CFO Kutza doesn't need uh, time other than to say thank you and we'll let her do that after that. So if we could, um, I wanna make, I hope it's okay with the commissioners to run over just a little bit. Okay, Jim. Go ahead. Oh, Madam Chair, commissioners, thank you. I see the, uh, our host has blocked me from video, so I hope everybody can hear me. Um, yes, we can. Ah, uh, there we go. Uh, again, my name is Jim Miller. I'm chair of CPAC. Uh, this afternoon, you've heard a series of high power professional presenters. Um, I am not, I'm a civilian and a volunteer. Um, I don't have any uh, good automobile, insightful automobile analogies for you, but I'm, I'm here on behalf of the committee members just to thank you uh, for your support and to thank the staff as well. The, um, it's been a challenging year for all the reasons you know with Zoom. I'm pleased to report that we completed our work. Um, it's been an unusual year. As Steve reported, we funded um, the 7.8 of the $10.4 million of, of regular projects. That's about 80% and, and very unusual. Um, and in the interest of time, and I appreciate Madam Chair, the opportunity just to say a quick word, uh, I'd just like to conclude by saying, I consider CPAC uh, still very relevant and important. It's um, a, an excellent form of citizen participation. It promotes transparency. And then finally, we, as your appointees, we contribute perspectives from around Ramsey County. So. Uh, with that, I'll conclude my remarks and uh, respond to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner McGuire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Miller. It's great to see you and thanks for your, your work and all the work of the CPAC committee. Um, Madam Chair, I don't, I don't know who this question, who wants to take this question, but it's a, it's a general question about our bonding projects that we, we fund internally versus those that we ask the legislature for. And I just wanna make sure that we're looking at these projects through a lens of, well, maybe this is something we could ask the legislature for, like as in a landmark funding or, or the barn, you know, these are historic buildings and sometimes, you know, there's funding for that. So does the committee ever look at that? Like maybe we should go to the legislature for some of this or, or 
who 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 looks at it that who who does or is it our job at this point to say well hey maybe maybe we should go to the legislature for some of this like i know we have our major projects for bonding at the legislature already but sometimes these smaller ones you know can also get there and the legislature is open to funding like i know they're open to funding landmark center so um and these are really buildings of regional significance so i'm just asking the the bonding question about whether we fund it ourselves or whether we go to the legislature. Madam Chair, County Manager O'Connor to respond. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, Commissioner McGuire, what I would say is that we run into the problem that MMB asks us for like two or three bonding priorities. And I don't think the items you just cited would have crowded out the ones we submitted last year. So from a practical perspective, I'm not sure how we would do that. I'm not suggesting it's not a good idea to continue to explore ways to do it. And so if we could follow up with that as a part of the legislative committee and conversation, I would welcome that because any way we can find partners to help fund our projects helps open up more that we are able to do here locally. And, and Madam Chair, thank you for that. County Manager O'Connor, I agree we had to submit our three larger projects to MMB, but I, I think it is still possible to add these to our list, even if MMB doesn't put them on their priority list, we can certainly put in our own legislation for some of these. And I, I just want to make sure we're, we're thinking about that. So we'll, um, I'll continue to, to look at that as well um, as we move forward here. And as a former member of the CPAC before I became a county commissioner, um, one of the reasons that there are two categories is, is pretty much for that very reason because the, the regular ones are more maintenance, um, slight, this, I, there may be some enhancements, but mostly it's what do we need to get done versus what would we like to get done. Um, and so the, 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 the larger projects especially, um, we're asking for CPAC's opinion on it. We, the questions that are asked there are really valuable um, but ultimately, those are beyond what we would do internally, generally. Um, so, yes, but there are some on there in that non-regular um, area, especially that um, we may well want to um, elevate to asking for uh, legislative funds for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate, uh, Jim, you taking the time to be here and the really thorough way of um, putting this together for us so that we can get through it. And I know we're gonna have more information on it uh, later as well. So thank okay. you very, very much. Thank you. Okay, then um, the uh, last but not least, uh, DeAndre Lindsay, the investment and debt manager, I think um, now you're just totally responsible for the AAA bond ratings, right? <laughs> okay, maybe not, <laughs> but um, we'll let you uh, present your information. Um, this is obviously our investment and debt re and debt um, manager is uh, debt, debt management. Excuse me, is a really important part of what we do in uh, the strategic team. So, go ahead, Dre. Um, you're on mute. Dre, you're on mute. And now you're gone. <laughs> okay, do we know what's happening? Madam Chair, um, just give me one minute, I'll, I'll message him. Okay. I know he had had micro microphone issues in the past, but we practiced and I think this was resolved. So let's just give him a minute of grace to figure out if he can get back okay. on here. Sounds great. Maybe I scared him away by saying, putting so much pressure on him. <laughs> no, I think he should take full credit for the AAA bond rating. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, Dre, if you have a headset, maybe try that if you can hear us. He still seems to be connected. CFO, Chris, if you'd like, we could suggest that at some point we could do this on one of the other days. We could tag this on That's to true. one of our other pieces and we could work on the technology in the meantime. 
Well, and that also gives him the time that he really needs because we are a running overtime, which makes it a little more difficult. So uh, CFO Kutza, let me, let, tell me what you'd like to do here. Okay, I, I think we'll just, um, we can hopefully add him on tomorrow at some point for the last budget hearings, if that's okay with you, Madam Chair and commissioners, and I will work to make sure the technology works. And that way you're right, he will get a little more time and y'all will get a few minutes back of your evening. Okay, why don't we put it on at the beginning of the- Perfect. Uh, the hearings tomorrow. Hopefully he's available. I'm sure he will be. I know he is very excited to present. So thank you. We'll make sure we can work out right at 8.30 tomorrow morning. We'll start off by finishing this presentation. Okay. Uh, and I take it that's, I thought tomorrow was at nine for some reason. Oh, maybe it is nine. I'm I sorry. I could be wrong. I, I just want to um, make sure. Let me double check. I'll double nope, check. Nope. It's 8.30. Okay. You're right. It's 8.30. Okay, um, and you wanted to say thank you. Yeah, thank you so for I'll the time you today. <laughs> I'll just end with that. Thank you for the time, all the commissioners, and for the support. I feel I think we're a very well aligned team, and I hope you saw that today. And I look forward to um, talking more about the budget over the next couple months. Thank you very much. Um, with that, uh, for today, we are adjourned, and we will uh, reconvene as the Budget Committee of the Whole at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Have a good evening. Take care. Thanks, everyone.